Good day, everyone. This is Jack Van Horn from the University of Southern California and the uh, uh, Big Data to Knowledge Training Coordinating Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Big Data to Knowledge BD2K Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science webinar. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Gully Burns from the uh, Information Sciences Institute uh, here at the University of Southern California, where he'll be talking about the principles of scientific knowledge engineering. Uh, Gully Burns, as he is known to all of his friends, uh, studied physics as an undergraduate at Imperial College uh, in London, England, until one day he had an epiphany that he wanted to wanted to study how the brain works. And after completing his uh, uh, doctorate at Oxford in 1997, he began work at uh, here at USC in the Neuroanatomy Laboratory of Professor Larry Swanson, and uh, began working building software solutions such as NeuroScholar and uh, NeuroArt, uh, Neuroanatomical Viewers. Um, and two th in 2006, he moved uh, kind of down the street uh, to the Information Sciences Institute, which is located uh, in Marina del Rey, uh, here on the west side of Los Angeles, um, to begin working in uh, a little more da of data science solutions and systems for biomedical knowledge engineering. Uh, one of his main career goals is to transform the way in which scientific knowledge uh, is utilized so that scientific discovery becomes commonplace, powerful, and easy. And uh, as we uh, uh, are, are going to begin hearing from Dr. Burns here in a second, I want to ask everybody to uh, just a little reminder, if you have any questions for Dr. Burns uh, throughout his uh, presentation to use the little question submission system here in the GoToWebinar uh, interface there on probably on the uh, right side of your screen. Send those in and during the last 10 minutes or so of the hour we'll, uh, I'll read those off to him uh, and you'll get a chance to uh, get some of your questions answered and I'm sure that he'd be delighted to share his contact information with you so should you have any questions you can reach out to him directly. So uh, with that and without further ado, um, Gully, thank you so much for taking the time to present to us. We're really looking forward to it. Thanks again. Thank you, Jack. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay? Well, it, is my microphone working? It seems as though it's okay. It is. It is. Great. Okay. So um, the organization of the talk today um, is broken down into just basically five parts. Um, I may have too much material, so I'll probably start skipping stuff if we look. If it looks as though uh, we're running short of time. Um, but essentially, I'm going to try and just give a high-level overview as to what scientific knowledge engineering is really all about. Um, I'm going to describe how this kind of works currently in the community, how people build their knowledge systems and how um, scientific uh, databases and scientific databases leverage the kind of technology that scientific knowledge engineering is all about. Um, and that, but, but I, I also want to kind of um, highlight some failings and questions about um, general approach that people have towards scientific knowledge engineering and that most people when they think of this discipline they think of knowledge schemas and database schemas and that's not the whole thing. Um, then I'm just at the end of the talk if we've got time I'm going to talk a little bit about my own ideas and about um, how I see the world and uh, strategies that I think can help people who are trying to develop their own systems um, you know how would you go about starting the process of doing that and what are some important things to think about when you're actually kind of getting started with building a system. And then I wanted to start end with a, a kind of high level idea of um, just presenting the kind of notion of artificial scientific intelligence. What would it look like to have machines be able to do science? Uh, okay, so um, first question is what is scientific knowledge engineering? Uh, and um, I wanted to kind of draw on work by a guy called Paul Rosenblum who wrote the, a book um, on the great scientific domains and he actually was talking about computing as a great scientific domain in the same way that physical sciences, life sciences and social sciences are. Um, he kind of draws a nice idea that says well you know you need when we think of science we think of social science, physical science and life science but computer science is a, a valid kind of companion of these three but it also um, uh, beautifully kind of complements them and works together with them. Um, and the definition that he has for computing is what I really like, which simply says that computing involves the transformation of information. Uh, and when we're kind of thinking about the evolution of science, um, we go invariably to um, the great Jim Gray from Microsoft, who, um, and if anybody's listening is kind of wants a good time, they should go to this uh, website at the bottom to look at some of Jim's talks. Um, he's a, he was a luminary. He's isn't sadly no longer with us, but 
um, really fantastic work. And and he his vision was that um, whereas thousands of years ago um, people would perform empirical science, so you basically look at the stars and you try and explain them. And then as we progressed, uh, we would develop an analytical approaches to kind of explaining things. You build analytical models to describe the physics of the motion of planets and, and such like. Uh, and then more recently, we've gotten into computational science, where all of a sudden we have large scale data sets and large scale analytical models. Um, and we're able to kind of generate uh, computation on these things. And then the final, the, the kind of fourth paradigm, as he talks about, is this notion of e-science, where you have a lot of data, a huge amount of data, big data captured by instruments or generated by simulators, and then processed by high power, high power tools, such as workflows, and then can be placed into a database, a file, a set of files, or a knowledge base. And then the scientist kind of interacts with the database on those files in order to make predictions and do their, do their scientific work. Um, and although, you know, I think this is a beautiful representation of how things have evolved, we've certainly not gotten rid of empirical science or analytical science. So it, it's worth thinking that, that even though we have evolved to include e-science in the whole process, we still need to think about empirical science as a process that um, is still valid and still important for certain things. Um, and so, you know, the point that I'm making here is really that computing in other words, the, the notion that um, the transformation of information has always been fundamental to scientific work. And whenever we've done science in the past or in the future, we are always going to have to have structures that allow us to deal with information, transform it, make sense of it, and create it. So before computers, we had uh, scientific notebooks. This is a page from Darwin's field notebook. Um, we have libraries, literature. We have mathematics, scientific theory, classical statistics, all of these structures that help us manipulate the information, um, not on a computer, but nonetheless, we're still manipulating the information. And now, of course, we have large-scale data analysis methods and, and simulation tools and databases to help us with this process. But we shouldn't lose track of the idea that, that essentially computation, computing is kind of a fundamental aspect of scientific work and has been from the very start. Now, just to kind of dive into a little bit of philosophy, if you'll forgive me, um, I wanted to introduce the term reification. And reification is an interesting kind of idea that it's basically, it's when we try to think of something abstract, like a concept or an idea as a material or concrete thing. And so what's interesting about this is that we can think of apparatus. So this is a quote from a book called Laboratory Life, which is again, a great read. <clears throat> um, it, it says it's like we can think of apparatus as reified theory. So when another member uses the NMR spectrometer, for example, to check the purity of his compound, he is using spin theory and the outcome of 20 years of basic physics research. So in other words, the equipment and the tools and the systems that we build somehow kind of concretize abstract scientific theory into a thing, into objects, and those objects can be virtual in the sense they can exist as algorithms or computer programs that live in a computer, or they can be actual physical apparatus like an NMR spectrometer. And so that's really what this is about. Scientific knowledge engineering is really about how do you turn scientific knowledge into a material or concrete thing? Um, and the process of basically developing information uh, based systems to capture, store, new scientific knowledge is central to this whole idea. Um, and, and so, you know, if you were to try and turn around and boil down the, the essence of what scientific knowledge engineering is really all about as a fundamental challenge, essentially we're asking the question is, okay, how do you build a representation of scientific knowledge? In other words, how do you write it down? How do you write the scientific knowledge down into a structure that you then would process and use with computers and so on? Um, and so, so at that, um, that's the kind of high-level introduction to what scientific knowledge engineering is in my mind. Uh, so let's go into a little bit of how this has shown up in computational systems and, and things that we, that we have access to um, in the world. So um, uh, this is taken from a, a paper which is a, a nice recent review of scientific knowledge engineering I'd recommend. Um, all the way through the, the talk I'll, I'll, I'll be citing information from other sources and um, hopefully the review, the, and I will I'll include references so that anyone watching or, or, or reading this can see where the information comes from, 
by all means, please follow up on these links and, and, and see if you can find things. Okay, so De, De Santos and Trevasos in their review describe the kind of basic fundamental idea of what scientific knowledge engineering is when we're, we're basically we're trying to build computational infrastructure. This is the little block that you see on the right hand side. And we have scientists engaging with the machine in two ways. First of all, as a knowledge engineer, in other words, you're basically trying to build the underlying schema and infrastructure of the system to kind of make it work. And then the scientist himself interacts with the system to, to make inquiries, to ask questions and to get answers back. Uh, and essentially that's a good way of thinking about the, the core uh, kind of role and approach that scientific knowledge, in, knowledge engineering has. Um, and, um, and so at this point it's kind of fun to think of the very first biomedical database that was ever created um, by humans uh, in a real and concrete way. And this is of course the Protein Data Bank or PDB. Um, this originated at a, a Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in 1972, and it really kind of came about because um, the technology for getting hold of um, molecular structural data was becoming more and more common, and not only that, but you were able to actually display and showcase the you know, computer programs being created at that time, very expensive and impressive computer programs uh, that were able to render the uh, images of these 3D models and kind of display them for a user to be able to see. So that's revolutionary at the time. Um, and basically what was, what was interesting about this was that every single molecule representation consisted of a bunch of different 3D um, positions of atoms in 3D space. And um, up until this point, no one had any real concrete way of being able to share the information within the community. So it's just a small group of people. Um, all of whom are experts, but they need to be able to share data. And so from and, and so they basically organized this um, transatlantic collaboration between America and, and, and Great Britain uh, and were able to generate a tool that was that has since nineteen seventy one has clearly um, really had an impact in the world and, and kind of uh, has stores very, very significant information has, and has embraced, you know, as um, really motivated research at the highest possible level. Um, and so this is a kind of example of, of the kind of data, the kind of systems that we're talking about, the kind of things that we're talking about. Now, <clears throat> if we fast forward to 2017, um, there is a uh, data, um, there is a publication called Nucleac Nucleic Acids Research, who every year publish a um, single article Oh, uh, sorry, a single issue that is devoted to all of the uh, molecular biology databases that you can possibly think of in the world. Um, and every year they basically receive papers that describe these databases. So each paper is a full write-up of each database in detail. Um, and every year, they, as you can see, they add about 200 or 300 um, individual uh, individual databases to their repository. Um, and since they've started, um, this is now in its 24th year, but since they've started, um, the collection of databases that they have amassed in terms of the descriptions that they have uh, consists of 15 categories, 41 subcategories, and there's almost 2,000, it's 1,893 separate databases listed in that collection. Um, and it's worth noting that, that, that 110 of these systems that they describe are really of the highest possible quality. These are um, the so-called golden set of databases that consist of um, the kind of systems that pretty much all biologists in the world use. So things like Uniprot and um, IEDB, these very, very high quality systems that are relied upon within the community. Now it's worth noting as well, that these are all molecular scientific databases. So um, it is a subset of the systems of the types of systems that are available. And not only that, but they are, um, the, the data that goes into these uh, databases tends to be more quantitative and more tractable. So even though it's complicated, even though there's a lot of um, huge number of different dimensions of this information that we need to track and keep and, 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 and moderate, um, it's actually, I would, <clears throat> I would say at some level, conceptually simple, <coughs> excuse me, conceptually simple, and, and relatively easy to kind of capture, um, although of course um, it's still very difficult. 
but it is possible. So <clears throat> the state of the art for scientific databases currently um, is uh, that the, the kind of technology that goes into generating these systems, all 1,893 of them, um, is simply normal data-driven web applications. Um, these are databases that serve scientific communities, but the chances are the technology that underlies them is kind of similar to the, to the types of websites that you might um, see online um, from any kind of industry or any kind of company. Uh, if anything, they probably lag somewhat behind the, um, the curve in terms of the sophistication of the, of the portal interfaces and such like, because um, we are on scientific budgets and we have to get money from the government to do this rather than being able to hire uh, um, being able to command the kind of salaries that uh, Google and Facebook and these other places are able to do. But nonetheless, um, the technology that underlies it is pretty standard. Um, usually it's something like a, a website with a relational database backend implemented either in a commercial system like Oracle or MySQL, Postgres, or anything like that. And so within this context, what scientific knowledge engineering really is all about here is really how do you design your database and how do you design your web application? Um, and of course, the interesting challenge of that is that rather than dealing with information that you'll find in Facebook or, or a business company or something like that, you actually have to deal with complex scientific knowledge. And, and that is itself, of course, a challenge because um, scientific knowledge is hard to understand, it's complicated, it's multifaceted, it has a whole bunch of different things going for it. So, so essentially, when we're talking about these, all these hundreds and thousands of databases that are, exist online, essentially the question we have to ask from a scientific knowledge engineering standpoint is how do you structure your data? How do you understand how it all fits together? So first question you have to ask is how should your database schema describe the data you want to share? Um, the next question that you'd have to ask is, well, where does the data come from that you want to put in your database? Um, now this can come from the literature, <clears throat> and if you do derive it from the scientific literature, maybe you need to hire people to read the literature. In other words, these are called bio-curators or curation staff, uh, who are typically expert scientists themselves, and therefore are quite expensive to, to pay and to maintain. Uh, but nonetheless, in order to be able to actually preserve a half-decent database, you'll, you need to have high-quality high quali high curated information. Um, or maybe you'll, um, maybe the database that you're working with wants to store laboratory-based data, information that comes, um, that's used, that isn't published, that is coming off of a machine somewhere. Um, and if that's the case, then you have to consider how the data is formatted. And also, what about metadata? What about the context of the, inform of the data itself? So if you have a, let's say that you, you have an MRI database that you want to, um, you want to store magnetic resonance imaging from, um, you are going to have to actually, you can't just take um, all of the files that you have, put them online and say, hey, everybody, go at it. Hey, take a look at this. You have to think about how the data itself is structured um, that describes each individual person that the scans are taken from and what the context is and how it all works. And that is itself a very big challenge too. Um, in fact, that's probably the bigger challenge than storing the original data files. Now, and of course, it's like the other question is, how should your um, website serve the data to your end users? So you have a bunch of people who need access to this information. What's the context of the access that they're looking for? How, how do you, what kind of functionality do you provide? All of these questions are actually scientific knowledge engineering questions and require you to think about and construct the system pretty much in the same way that you would do for any other um, web application or any other web system. Um, but because it's scientific data, you have to think about these things in a more deep way. Um, and then finally, a question that comes up that, that's important for people in the community is how are you handling standardization of your information? So as you can see, if we have 1,893 databases, they can't all use different um, ways of describing what a protein is. They need to standardize the approach that they're using. And there are um, as we'll get into it, this is actually probably one of the key questions of scientific knowledge engineering that, that, that we're going to cover today. Um, but in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not an easy, not a, um, a, an easy thing to, to kind of address. So, um, so the question then comes into, 
um, at what stage in the scientific process do you actually build your system? Um, this diagram very quickly kind of shows the various different uh, types of options that you have and you, there are people who, who build systems straight from the laboratory. Um, my colleague Carl Kesselman at ISI has built a system called Deriva that does just this. Uh, and then perhaps you, you, or you might want to build a system that describes the primary literature, the, 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 the literature that, that kind of captures the experimental data at, at source. Or maybe you want to build a database that captures and summarizes the review literature. Um, each one of these has a various different um, set of parameters and balances and checks that needs to happen. But it's interesting that the further away you get from the laboratory, the more kind of, um, well, the less efficient the system is and the more kind of, um, uh, you know, pre-chewed the, the data can be. It's, it's actually, and, and of course, it, this efficiency question is, is pretty important. It seems silly for us to build, um, for us to spend huge amounts of money on funding to um, scientists to do their work, publish papers, and then have to spend huge amounts of money on funding to develop ways of extracting that information from primary literature in order to put into databases, um, which is actually kind of what we're doing at the moment. So, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, going back to standardization, um, this is a comic from XKCD, uh, which I think captures very well how this process sadly um, does actually work. Um, the, if you have a situation where there are many competing standards, um, as is the case with uh, biomedical databases and um, all of these various different approaches, um, if you come into the situation and say, oh my god, there's 14 competing standards, we need to develop one universal standard that covers everybody's use cases, everybody agrees with you and this is great, then typically what happens is that your standard becomes yet another example of a competing standard that has to compete with everything else. Um, now this is, a, this is a, uh, a pitfall that a lot of people are aware of and we're trying desperately to kind of work around, uh, but nonetheless, um, as you'll probably see quite soon, um, <coughs> this is still a real problem that causes uh, headaches for scientists all the time. Um, now, um, so I just wanted to talk very briefly about, um, just to give you kind of, just to give everybody on the call uh, an idea of the complexity of what a database, typical good quality database schema would look like. So um, there's a system called CHADO, or CHADO, I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, uh, which is a part of the Generic Model Organism Database Project. Um, this is a database that's implemented in Postgres SQL. And essentially, it's designed to provide standardized schema. I'm sorry, there's a, I, I have a, um, uh, for, genom for genomic data associated with generic model organisms. Now, generic model organisms, organisms are things like mice, uh, Drosophila, fruit flies, um, cats, rats, anything that, any kind of standard um, organism that people use to perform experiments on. Um, and one of the kind of goals of the, the GMOD project is to standardize representation and processing of data from, of different types from these various different model organisms <coughs> in a standard way. Um, the database itself is actually quite big. It's, it's a consists of 18 so-called modules, um, which subdivide the task into 133 tables. Um, but it is used by a relatively large number of databases for different model organisms. So it's a you can consider this to be a, a, a success in the community. Um, and I just wanted to kind of show you that the basic data structure of these things is it can actually get quite complicated. So <coughs> one of the tables is this notion of a feature um, in the database. This is the kind of thing that you might, um, uh, that, that would be a, a general kind of, a general purpose, um, phenotypic uh, aspect of the of a model organism's um, process or, or, you know, something that's happening in the model organism that you want to keep track of. And if you draw out uh, all the data tables associated with this, including links to the organism, links to uh, publications in the pub table or locations of the, of the feature features, 
this is actually quite a, um, a fairly complicated and in-depth <coughs> data structure. Um, understanding this is, is no joke. And of course, if you look at, in fact, the um, if you look at the structure of the of the database um, as a whole, if you looked at the scaled up for the whole thing, it would be vastly more complicated than this and actually quite difficult to understand. In addition, what's important is that the um, semantics and the structure of the database is often kind of embedded in the uh, names of the actual terms that occur. So the CV term is, is a table for controlled vocabulary term. And the nature of the semantics of the database are going to depend very heavily on the types of terms that go into that table. So from a scientific knowledge engineering point of view, of being able to understand and build this kind of system, um, you have the underlying infrastructure of the, of the, of the database tables that you have to understand if you're, if you're working with GMOD databases. <coughs> but you also have to understand the terminology, and you have to understand how the various different terms link together and um, link to existing databases and do all these things. So, so this is just to kind of give you a glimpse of the level of complexity that's required in these um, various different approaches and systems. Okay, so in order to kind of deal with this notion of standardization um, across the various different biomedical databases that we, we will encounter, um, people in the community have developed this note, have developed this notion or rather use the notion of ontologies. And ontologies is a construct from AI, um, which is uh, the best definition I've come across is that by Gruber in 1993, who says simply that it is a specification of a conceptualization. So in other words, um, the way in which it's just a kind of a representation, a computational representation of how concepts come about. And um, my colleague, Ed Hovey, um, in 2005, wrote a beautiful little chapter um, that describes five methods of ontology construction. And he breaks it down from a, high, from a very high level, um, looking at the various different communities of people who build ontologies within the computer science, um, commu within the computer science community. Um, and he, he, he describes them as five different types. So there's the philosophers, the cognitive scientists, the linguists, the computational reasoners, and the domain specialists. And um, what's interesting about this is that typically, and we'll go into a little bit of how um, biomedical ontologies are largely driven by a philosopher's perspective currently, um, but there are other approaches that in, are based upon, um, which we won't touch on in detail, but there are other approaches based um, derived from linguistic approaches using just the meanings of words, or domain specialists such as biomedical scientists who just need to kind of represent the information in their in their community as accurately and straightforwardly as possible um, they um, typically have a different approach from the philosophers but um, it's worth kind of trying to consider all of them uh, and I think the thing that I wanted to leave everybody on the call with if just as a kind of a, a real concrete um, piece of advice is that if anyone tells you that there's one only one correct way of developing ontology there's a standard methodology that everybody uses, that everybody agrees on, they're wrong. This thing doesn't, there, there isn't such a thing. Um, there are schools of thought, and there are people who address the question in a given way, but there's no one correct way. Um, I think that uh, it would be a, do a disservice to anyone to try and suggest that, 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 that only one way is, is the best way. And of course, different types of methodologies trying to address this question run into different pitfalls and problems. So. If we're going to solve the problem appropriately and powerfully, we need to use all the tools at our disposal and kind of try and make sense of things um, by leveraging any, any and all approaches that work and that provide us with actual working tools. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, a very important uh, set of work from the um, scientific community called the Open Biomedical um, uh, Ontologies, actually and they call themselves the Obo Foundry. Um, and this is an attempt to organ standardize ontologies across all of biology, uh, to provide a kind of common framework for building these knowledge representations that everybody can use in the same way. Um, <clears throat> and this approach does involve many important standard ontologies, such as the gene ontology, 
KB Human Disease Ontology. There's one called the Ontology of Biomedical Investigation, or OB. It's, it's, it's significant. And so there are a bunch of these, these various different representations of, of knowledge that, that, we, that you, you should be aware of. Um, and the approach broadly, broadly uses the basic formal ontology as an upper ontology. So, um, and we'll describe very briefly what basic formal ontology is all about just to give you an, an idea of how it all is structured. Um, and so Oboe Foundry lists 156 separate ontologies. Um, and it, this is very much driven by a community of philosophers who have a kind of a clear idea as to how they recommend seeing the world. And part of the representation, as you'll see, um, it tries to provide a kind of a global um, catch-all type of view of the world, of the things that exist in the world, so that we can all kind of fit our various different, if you want to build a, re a representation of, <coughs> of things from domain A, then that should be able to fit into the, the schema provided by the, BA, the basic formal ontology. If you want to um, look at uh, other things, they, they should all fit together. This is the kind of vision of the oboe community and how they would like to see it. And um, this is a complicated diagram. Don't panic. Uh, I'm going to kind of walk through it. But this is the, the kind of high-level representation of how oboe foundry ontologies are constructed. <coughs> the first, the top-level object is just an entity. It's a thing. Um, and then there are two types of underlying, um, then they basically split the universe into two different types, into continuance and occurrence. And so the idea is, is like when you talk about a thing, um, and, and the basic way, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how all these various different elements work, um, and I hope I get this correct, but occurrence are things that, that do not physically exist in the world. Continuance exists in the world as physical objects. So over here you see on the left-hand side there's an entry called the material entity. That could be a supernova or an, uh, a, phys uh, a, a neutron star or a cup or a chair or a pen or a neuron, right? Um, those are all physical objects. And essentially, um, the, the, way in which, and the way in which the BFO represents this is they kind of, they try and construct things that exist in the world um, and they distinguish between the different things in order to kind of construct a kind of global theory of how um, things are organized. <coughs> Excuse me. So, for example, um, a spatial region like uh, your, I don't know, the, the country of um, um, the United States of America um, is a thing, but it's, it's kind of defined by a spatial region, um, and it's not really a kind of the, the land mass upon which it's built. It's kind of the region that's contained within the land. Anyway, I'm getting off the, off the topic. So you have continuance and you have occurrence, and occurrence are things like processes. Um, so... Uh, it, it, these can be thought of as things because you can describe them with words and they, they are concepts, but they're not physical entities in the same way that continuance are. So I probably just mangled that and any, any ontologists on the call are probably tearing their hair out. Um, but this is, I just wanted to kind of include this as a significant part of the process of working in um, biomedical, in the biomedical area because a lot of people use basic formal ontology, and it's it. You have you should go away and look at it. Look at this website, um, <coughs> and become familiar with it if you if you want to do work on this area. Um, another significant tool, another significant approach is the BioPortal, which is put together by um, Mark Newson's group in Stanford, um, and it's a large scale uh, knowledge on um, uh, uh, sorry on, ontology catalog. So it's a list of um, various different schema describing various different domains of, of knowledge. Um, and it contains 658 ontologies, so a sizable, um, sizably more than the Oboe Foundry um, collection. Um, but they're pretty non-standardized. It's like anyone who can submit something to BioPortal is allowed to do so. And so these are usually, they're not kind of built with the same unifying principles of, of, and constraints of having to conform to a standard, complicated, difficult uh, ontological design, because as you can, as you you might be aware, the the if you if you try to <coughs> use the basic formal ontology as the kind of core representation of your work, 
you can fit it into the schema of everything else, but but you also um, increase your overhead in terms of being able to develop um, things in the short term. So BioPortal provides um, a nice catalog of a large number of different um, representations that you can use and you can scan, you can kind of like get into very quickly um, without the overhead of having to kind of fit it into this complex um, higher level schema. And then finally, I wanted to talk about the fairsharing.org uh, community. And FAIR is a, is a kind of acronym that, that uh, is being adopted widely throughout the community to try and pro make sure that we, when we develop our systems and our, our schema and our knowledge bases and all of these various different things, we want to, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So, and there are a whole set of principles that are published um, that one can find online. I don't think I have a link here, I'm afraid. I'm, Apologize for that. Um, that that allows you to uh, that gives you a checklist of things you need to do in order to make your tools and systems um, compatible with these principles. Um, and Jack actually, in a moment of brilliance, kind of um, suggested that we add the letter E on fair for education because um, I think that that's important because the um, the a lot of these systems are quite um, challenging to understand and the and we're so busy a lot of the time kind of dealing with computational interfaces and systems and such like that we forget that we need to actually make humans be able to use these things. Um, another thing about the fair sharing um, system is they talk about they talk about standards but they also talk about kind of standards within the community communities and policies. So as a repository describing a large number of these various different um, artifacts and things that are worth looking at, this is a good place to look, and this is a good place to find find interesting material. <coughs> now, no talk about knowledge engineering and the web and everything would be complete without talking at least a little bit about linked open data and the linked data cloud. Now, this is this is a, a diagram taken from the um, lod.cloud.net website. And it's this gargantuan image of all of the various different parts of um, the semantic web um, community that deals with various different types of uh, knowledge. And the important thing about this is that, um, so if you just take a look at this, this the diagram as a whole, um, you'll notice that the various different parts of the diagram can be split up into different sections. <coughs> in, in fact, life sciences forms probably the largest um, individual sub-community of um, the, the linked data cloud. Uh, and, and essentially every dot in this, in this diagram, every circle, describes a large scale knowledge resource, a, a database if you like. And the promise of what linked data can do is that it allows you to actually connect entities from one ontology, with, uh, from one knowledge base into other knowledge, knowledge bases using ontologies. And so this is kind of inspiring if you, if you just kind of sit back and look at this. I mean, um, we, we're not going into the details of any individual um, node, but this, is, this kind of gives you an idea of what could be possible. Um, this is some type of, of human knowledge that's available in this format currently. Um, and if you think about every individual database and links together and how it could be used to inform things, that's actually pretty cool. <coughs> of course, the, the, the devil is really in the details with the stuff, and um, you have to be able to understand the schemas of these various different ontologies to be able to query them effectively. And so it's not necessarily just an easy task to, to pull information necessarily out of this um, cloud whenever you can, but this is a, an expanding research area, and I think it's pretty cool. So other important stuff that I don't have, really have time to talk about um, from the community are things like, um, well, um, research objects. These are, um, this is work by Carol Goebel's group um, when they define uh, in Manchester and they define, um, well, these encapsulated packages of scientific knowledge. So <coughs> in the same way that a scientific publication kind of draws together different elements into a single place, um, <coughs> a research object provides a semantic web-based representation of everything that you would need to know about a data set, including the data set, set itself, provenance about where the data, data set came from, maybe even a workflow that generates 
generates it, maybe even the publication that is included in these things. So I would recommend looking at that as a, an important aspect and an important, important development in the field. And then, of course, uh, workflows are a, a, a fairly long-standing um, piece of research in the community where essentially you, you're basically putting computational analysis together in order to generate, um, in order to be able to run programs um, reproducibly and reliably. And I won't talk about that anymore. So um, let's move on. So this, in the next part, I wanted to, um, we've talked a lot about how knowledge schemas and databases and the underlying architecture of these systems work. But it's important to leave you with the notion that schemas are not the whole story, um, especially when you're dealing with the kind of representation of, of what knowledge is. Um, if you look at this, so this figure shows you, a um, it's kind of a high level view of 80,000, each dot represents um, an NIH grant that was funded, I think, in 2010. I could be wrong about the exact year. Uh, and each, so there are 80,000 dots for each grant that was funded by NIH, all broken down by color um, for each individual um, uh, agency that was, um, each of the agencies that were, um, <clears throat> sorry, each institute that was funding the work. And it's important to note that most of the databases that we are talking about here probably occur up here, right? There's all of this kind of like knowledge and stuff that's collected into databases or in, in areas where molecular databases are well-founded. <coughs> but I don't know of many hematological databases that are really constructed in the same level of detail. I don't, I'm not sure of any epidemiology databases that are constructed in the same way. There are, there are individual examples, but there's nothing like the kind of coverage that you see in molecular biology. So, um, you know, just having schema, and so the whole point is that the, 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 the variety of information that you need to put into these systems is very large. Um, and when you're kind of dealing with uh, knowledge, um, you can't just talk about the, the structure of the knowledge itself, which is um, um, in this diagram, this is a kind of three-level representation of an approach called common CADs to modeling, um, so to modeling knowledge in a knowledge engineering context. And what's interesting about this approach is they have a whole methodology for trying to understand the context of the information. Like, what's the organization? How does the lab work that your, that your information is contained within? What is the task that the information is trying to describe? What are the people? What are the agents involved in, in doing the work? Um, and then, you know, the actual representation of the knowledge itself occurs here, but it is required a communication model to kind of figure out, okay, how does that knowledge, how is that knowledge used by the agents trying to solve the problem that the knowledge is useful for in communication? And <coughs> all of these various different elements combined together in, in the overall representation of the design model to give you the overall knowledge representation. Um, and of course, you know, if you're focused only on building ontologies, then you're only talking about one small piece of the puzzle. There's only one part of the, the overall structure of how you have to think about the, the modeling approach. And then um, another thing that's overlooked a lot of the time is how do you evaluate knowledge systems? Um, and there, um, according to this book by Edelman and Riedel, um, they describe this kind of multi-layered representation of the various different types of evaluation that you should think about. So um, and I'll just, I'll just put them all out so you can see them. <coughs> now, and so this is broken down into four different parts. Um, first of all, you should try and understand, so when you evaluate a knowledge system, you want to evaluate the requirements, you want to validate the knowledge in the system, whether or not is the, is, is the, the, the way in which the system deals with its knowledge correct? Does it form, does it behave appropriately? Um, very importantly, you know, when you build a website or you build a system that people are going to use, <clears throat> can you learn it easily? Does it work well? You have to evaluate it according to that kind of approach. And then finally, you know, um, performance evaluation, you need to be able to say whether or not your system does what it's supposed to do well. Um, and so these are all kind of evaluation metrics that, that are incredibly important for people doing this doing the work that I'm talking about. Um, but if we're focused only on schema and ontologies and building these artifacts, <coughs> we will miss this. 
And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's important to kind of, it's probably more impactful to build something that's less well-formed ontologically and more useful for scientists. Uh, and that's borne out by the example of the gene ontology, um, which is pr the most widely used ontology in the world today. It's incredibly successful and it's incredibly useful and important. And yet, <coughs> from a kind of classically uh, philosophically driven perspective, it, it doesn't really kind of solve, it, it, it has, it makes lots of shortcuts and it takes, um, and it kind of um, solves the problem in an ad hoc way, um, but it does so very well. <coughs> and part of the reason why it's useful is because people can understand. And so, um, just, uh, okay, so I wanted to, to kind of jump to, um, so that, that can kind of concludes the, the kind of advice giving part of the, of the talk. We've got about five minutes left as far as I can see, so I'll skim through the rest of it. Um, here I wanted to talk about um, some high-level ideas um, and kind of future directions of what we should be kind of thinking about. <coughs> and the work of Thomas Kuhn is an interesting guide to this process um, because Thomas Kuhn kind of described the notion of scientific paradigms. Uh, and his kind of notion is that it is basically some accepted examples of scientific practice a community, and I think of this as almost like a community of various different elements, which includes laws, theories, applications, instrumentations, social models of how scientists work together within a specific community, uh, and, and the coherent tradition of scientific research that constructs a paradigm <coughs> can be thought of as everything that contributes to how that paradigm works. Um, and, you know, Kuhn in his in seminal work, Structure of Scientific Revolution, talks about how normal science can, there's this kind of big cycle that works where you're going along in normal science and then you find something that's wrong, you find an anomaly. Uh, and then the anomaly is so great that perhaps you enter into crisis and your, your faith in your paradigm is shaken. You, you stop believing that, you know, classical, like, classical physics works and you have to invent an entire new approach. Uh, you create quantum mechanics, you go through this gestalt shift and then you have to kind of figure out how this new paradigm works within the context of neuroscience. And, and it's important to know that this very rarely happens. The, the, the kind of normal scientific work that we do day to day, the kinds of earth shattering anomalies that, that form the basis of this notion of, of a scientific revolution very rarely happens. And instead, we kind of find ourselves very much in the normal science process, um, where it's puzzle solving. Now, so within a, we, and it's important to note that, that um, there are many different paradigms all kind of over, overlapping and, and working together um, that do not necessarily talk to each other. There's a kind of siloing effect. So if you work in molecular biology and you work on, let's say you work on the molecular biology of schizophrenia, of, of schizophrenia for example, um, you'll look at pathways, you'll look at proteins, you'll look at molecules, but you won't necessarily look at patients. You'll read the literature about patients, but you won't understand how that works. So in a way, one can think of these, there are two paradigms kind of working together in a coordinated way, um, but they don't necessarily communicate. And part of the work that, that I'm trying to do is to figure out how easy, how more easily can we get these um, paradigms to kind of work together. Um, so I'm kind of getting off the subject a little bit, but um, instead of talking about this large scale paradigm shift type of approach, uh, a better model is treating <clears throat> um, scientific knowledge evolution as a kind of abductive argumentation process after um, uh, Toulmin's paper work. Uh, and an even better model, again, by the luminary Carol Goebel, um, is this notion of knowledge terms. And a knowledge term is a bit like, is, is kind of described in, in this approach by this notion of the cycle of scientific investigation, the idea that, that scientists start off with scientific knowledge, then they ask scientific questions, they go from, they, they're given a question, they design experiments, they, they then um, execute experiments to get data, and they get knowledge. And essentially, uh, what we're trying to do is to provide a framework to speed up the process of going around the cycle. Um, I'm actually running out of time, so I'm going to just quickly skim over this work. This is actually my contribution. Um, this is something called knowledge engineering from experimental design. The idea is that uh, if you, if one way of dealing with knowledge at a, in a, in a, in a, in a principled way is to draw out the scientific protocol of whatever experiment you're talking about, 
um, you can then trace the um, the provenance back through the protocol and indicated by this red line um, <coughs> from the kind of starting point of the experiment um, and if you look at these various different um, uh, the idea is that each square block is an entity each circle is a process and they're, they're variously um, parameterized by these um, kind of blocks um, such as animal number, cannula position, and such like. If you trace back the protocol in this way, you then can build a knowledge representation that's very generic uh, and works very well across different uh, methods. I won't go into it. If you're interested, please look at this paper from Russ 2011. That should um, let you know. And the idea is the kind of take home of this is that if you approach the, the methodology of modeling experiments using this kind of technique, you sh we should be able to actually um, go beyond the molecular biology experiments and, and try and represent data from all sorts of different things. Okay, and then so finally, um, just to kind of, um, uh, I'll, I'll finish on a kind of high note, um, <clears throat> talking about artificial scientific, scientific intelligence, because we talk about AI all the time. And I wanted to highlight the work of Ross King, who is an, one of my heroes, he's awesome. Uh, he works in Manchester University and he's built, he spent his career building robots that that kind of go around the cycle of scientific investigation automatically without humans. This is a robot that can reason scientifically, it constructs its own theories, it comes up with its own hypotheses, and it tests those hypotheses through experiment. Um, it's an absolute, you know, it's really, really interesting. Now the thing about this is though, it takes a lot, of, it's, it's a kind of very pre-programmed environment. The robot can only ask one kind of question that it's programmed to look at. It can't think independently. Uh, and so, one kind of big high-level idea that I have is could we use educational methods that would normally score scientific expertise in a, in a sub-discipline, could we apply that to computers and to our computers, computer systems? And a colleague of, of ours, Rachel Trachtenberg, has put together a model of, um, in this case, um, statistical literacy that rates um, people on levels of beginner, functional, skilled, independent, or master, or expert, um, and I thought it would be interesting, you know, why don't we apply this to our computational systems? If we were to apply this to our computational systems, the very best systems that we currently have would be at this level, would be beginners, where they basically remember facts, you type in a query and it tells you what you what they remember. What would it take for us to develop computer systems that are capable of higher levels of reasoning and intelligence to do with science? And that's what I want to leave you with as a final note. So thanks to, this is just a list of people who have inspired me and helped me and kind of given terrific leadership and feedback in my career. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Billy. That was a really great overview of, of, of scientific knowledge engineering and a number of different key aspects that you need to think about as you uh, Undertake this uh, maybe yourselves, or 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 you're interacting with systems and kind of getting a, some insight into how they're built. One question that uh, I would like to just uh, just remind everybody that if you do have questions, please send them in via the uh, the question submission system so that uh, uh, we'll be able to get them in front of uh, of Dr. Burns. Uh, Gully, as people begin to consider ontologies and how the the, the the thing about knowledge or the knowledge domain in which they want to um, begin modeling how do you how do they begin and how do they constrain it I mean it seems like you're sort of throwing a dart in a, in, in a dark room throwing a dart at a dart board hoping that you hit someplace and then that's the the place that you begin and then things start to spider outwards in terms of what you're attempting to knowledge or to knowledge uh, model and then how do you stop it so that it doesn't grow unconstrained and it becomes this intractable problem how do you kind of keep it real if that makes any sense yeah okay great great question Jack so I think a good starting point is to look at um, actually, go to the um, Big Data U um, uh, resource and look for courses on data modeling generally. Um, mm -hmm. Now, and, and essentially there are, there are tons of courses that you can see about this kind of thing um, that describe, you know, how do you develop models in the UML language, for example, um, the 
unified modeling language, which is, a, which is used by software engineers to develop things like Java libraries and databases and such like. Um, that gives you a kind of high level way of building schema that, that, that gives you a kind of an overview that, that it's widely used within the industry. So, <clears throat> you know, master's level computer scientists can easily grasp that kind of thing. Um, and then it's a short jump from um, really taking, taking the notion of a class-based or object-oriented schema and converting that into an owl ontology consisting of classes and um, attributes and um, elements, right? So, and I think that, that you know, the, a colleague of mine once said, um, no representation without implementation. Uh, as a kind of general rule, you know, alluding to, of course, no taxation without representation. Um, but I think that that's a really good idea. So don't try and represent something that doesn't go in your system at some point. You know, this is, you know, don't try and represent something that you don't have an example for. Like if you, what you need to do whenever you represent data or knowledge, what does it look like if you take a real worked example and, and kind of flesh it out? And so my advice is to you basically get a pen and paper and draw out whatever full scale example knowledge that you're trying to work from and take a look at that and make sure that that's queryable and, and operable so that you can actually do stuff with it. How does um, knowledge engineering take into account um, a, a kind of counter examples, if you will? Um, and I'm thinking of you know the is a and has a relationships of these tr the tree the classic tree diagrams that uh, ontologies have and you know if you're modeling something that you know a human is uh, you know has arms you know and but what there are humans that don't have arms and so how can one kind of keep track of alternatives uh, within an ontological system that's still kind of, you know, they're still human, but this person was born without arms or had them, you know, they were uh, uh, lost in an accident yeah. or something. How, how does it handle that sort of stuff? Right. Well, I, I think that, that it's like any piece of computational architecture. You have to, uh, the more um, complex and rigid you make, the, the more complex and rigid you make it, the less likely it, it is to be useful and yet the more easily the more quick and dirty you build it, um, you'll be able to get it up and running, but it won't be able to solve these indi individual cases. Um, I think that, again, I go back to this idea of what do you want this representation of a person with arms for? Is it a, is it a, is it a patient intake form? Is it a representation, you know, what's the actual use case that the, uh, that the knowledge is going to be used for? And yeah. Then, then you can do an error analysis and say, okay, look, of all the people we're going to see, this is not an important piece of information. But, and of course, that, that isn't a kind of universal solution that, that solves the problem from an AI complete kind of point of view, but it's still, that's a, very much my approach. I haven't talked about um, data modeling in a st using statistical models and neural networks in this, in this talk. Um, because we yeah, that was going to be my next question is is can some of <laughs> yeah. relationships be probabilistic for example um, yeah. or you know I don't know uh, it, it was going to ask you about that yeah that's a whole um, that that is an in, that's another talk um, I think that there's you know when we're talking about biomedical databases as you can see right the databases that people use in the scientific community are still mostly working with knowledge at the level of tables and, and attributes and, and schema. Right. Um, right. But, but there is a, a big push to try and build these systems that are capable of reasoning over the complex data spaces that you see in the real world, like the space of all microscope images taken from brain tissue. Um, if you were to sit down and you, you, you kind of like look at those brain images and you try and build a taxonomy and is a taxonomy of the different types of brain images, you will not succeed, right? But if you train a class of, but I've seen work where people are training classifiers who are able to, to leverage, who are able to classify tumors or, or various different kind of growths in the brain and such like, um, 
but will also uh, and and will also be able to kind of um, yeah do do other interesting things with the data. So so neural networks is very much a uh, are very much a kind of um, an important and exciting framework for for things to kind of move forward with. Um, <clears throat> and just in general, I think that that's a an observation that you see in the literature. You, there's, there's, this is definitely a kind of the trend of um, probably the most exciting trend that I've seen in terms of where this is going to go. It's not obvious exactly how it fits in with the existing symbolic representation of things um, as a general open-ended question. Um, but you know, that's I think that's a very exciting way in which this field is developing. Well, that may very well be the future. Well, we've reached the top of the hour, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, taking part in the Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, thank you to Gully Burns for sharing his thoughts on uh, scientific knowledge engineering with us. Uh, we really appreciate it, Gully. And uh, keep your eyes peeled uh, in your email for further announcements about uh, future uh, Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science uh, webinars. And until then, everyone have a great weekend, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, and thank you, Gully. Thank you.